can't have a trivial conversation with a man. You, you instantly are, are engaged in something of real meaning. He's a person who attracts you with tremendous accomplishment and commitment. And he does it in such a way that you take it for granted until you see what the man has actually done and what he's accomplished. My parents liked Dale because they thought he was a, a fine young man. And besides, he always found something to fix when he came to visit me. Dale Raymond Corson spent the first years of his life on a farm in southeastern Kansas. I rode a horse to school. Uh, teacher came with a horse and buggy, and uh, I had to unsaddle and saddle my horse and tie her in a shed and feed her at noon. His parents completed the eighth grade and wanted their children to go further. In 1923, the family moved to Emporia, where Corson completed grade school, then went on to high school and college. I remember the eighth grade general science teacher explaining the difference between chemistry and physics. And I can remember thinking, boy, that physics, that's for me. That's what I'm going to do. I never wavered from that. The mathematics now is way beyond what I studied in high school. but. I believe my education in the English language and English literature was superior to what high school students get these days. At least I learned to write sentences that had nouns and verbs both in them. I played varsity basketball in college and also tennis. At one time I was the Emporia, Kansas junior tennis champion and I have a silver cup to prove it. Next came a year of graduate study at the University of Kansas. The Depression hit the Plains hardest of all. Dale Corson worked odd jobs to scrape by. I still have the account book I kept that year. I spent a total of $380 for 11 months uh, there. I had a number of offers from various schools but Ohio State offered me a teaching assistantship, I think at $450 a year. So no question about where I was gonna go, Ohio State, I went there for a year. I was more ambitious than Ohio State. I applied at Berkeley and Caltech and was accepted at both, except Berkeley gave me a teaching assistantship and so I went to Berkeley. Money was especially important because Corson was planning to marry his college sweetheart, Nellie Griswold. Another big draw at Berkeley was the legendary experimental physicist, Ernest Lawrence. He was famous for having invented the cyclotron for accelerating particles, atomic particles. I had uh, ambitions of getting in on the act. I've never understood uh, completely why of all the people they could have selected for a rather small new class coming in, graduate students, coming in each year, they should take me. Uh, there's, there was a f fair amount of, uh, as there has been in all of my career, pure chance in, in all this. I discovered an element, uh, astatine, number 85 in the periodic table, uh, simply because I was there. Corson was a rising research star at Berkeley, but wanted to teach. He joined the faculty of the University of Missouri, but stayed only three months. World War II had begun. Ernest Lawrence summoned Corson to MIT, where he played a key role in the development and deployment of radar. There's a saying, at least, that people uh, associated with radar projects like to say, that radar won the war and the atomic bomb ended it. Corson went to the Pentagon to plot the implementation of radar. In 1946, Robert Oppenheimer, who had served on his doctoral committee at Berkeley, brought him to Los Alamos. From there, he went to Sandia to establish the famed National Laboratory, and then on to Cornell, where some of the country's leading physicists had come. 
One, Bob Sproul, would become a lifelong friend. My first impression was that he was the, the kind of the sensible, steady uh, part of the crew, whereas people like Dick Feynman and, of course, Hans Bethe were the much more impressive on first uh, appearance type. But Dale was somebody that, that grew, grew on you slowly. Just as Berkeley had been in the 30s, post-war Cornell was the place for a physicist. Many of my students in the early years after World War II were on the GI Bill. They knew exactly what they were here for and no nonsense about it. They were excellent students. I, it was just a joy to teach students like that. Corson helped lure another Los Alamos alumnus, Robert Wilson, from Harvard to build Cornell Synchrotron. Wilson was the kind of person who did not believe in organization. When he was summoned by the dean to explain the organization of the laboratory, he said it didn't have any, and he was ordered to come back with an organization chart the next day, so he made a mobile, stayed up all night and made a mobile out of laboratory equipment parts, and he had the dead weight of the staff balancing the ingenuity of the technicians and I don't know what all. That sort of set the management tone for the whole place. Corson's own knack for organization was well known. He became chairman of the physics department in 1956 and in 1959 was named dean of the engineering college. Dale tried to bring engineering into modern times and that wasn't easy because uh, a lot of the very able but, uh, but steeped in 1920s and 30s engineering people were still in the faculty, still with tenure. There was some strain because some of the uh, pragmatists thought that he was too visionary, that he was thinking too much in terms of, of research and uh, seeking of new knowledge, that the purpose and job and mission of the engineer was just to apply what's known. Well, Dale knew that, but he knew that there was a lot more that needed to be known. Decades ahead of the pack, Corson spawned Cornell's preeminence in material science and computer graphics. In 1963, a new president, James Perkins, named him provost. Diversity was a priority. Cornell had fewer than 10 American undergraduates of color. By 1968, the total had increased 25-fold but many felt alienated at Cornell. I think if we had continued to recruit only middle-class black students, these problems would have been at least minimized. But when we started getting students from Harlem, some of our best students have come from Harlem, they were much more conscious of the problems. They, they wanted action. They wanted answers now. When Cornell erupted, the trustees turned to Dale Corson. And so the campus was being torn in a number of different directions. Uh, Dale was the one person I think nearly everybody trusted. I met with every faculty on the campus. We met each college independently. Discussed the problems from their standpoint, what their ideas were. Uh, we got lots of people involved in, in the process. He was a person who was ex very committed to civil rights, and he thought Cornell had a, a, a pivotal role to play. He felt that, that Cornell both had the provender and needed, in some sense, to make a profound commitment to being an open, responsible, humane, a university where everyone who, who, who was smart and had something to bring to the table could come and be respected. But I think he also understood that at this moment of chaos, there were real possibilities. I didn't know this when I was a student during that time, but upon reflection, I would say he was exactly the perfect person for what Cornell needed in 1969. He wanted to make it the best possible university. Uh, and that was not only in his own fields of interest, engineering, the sciences, but across the board. And the thing that impressed me the most was the way the alumni were coming back. They clearly 
had great faith in Dale. He actively opposed the Vietnam War, but when protesters seized the engineering library, Dale Corson insisted that other students had rights too. We did two things. We let him sit, and second, we sought for the first time a court injunction. There are, for him, very real lines to be drawn. And part of that comes from love. You can't love an institution if you don't believe that there's something at, at the heart of that institution which is inviolable. That carried over into a key area where Corson believed hard decisions were necessary. Cornell's budget. I, I think Dale was one of the first to do the arithmetic uh, that showed that there were limits to what higher education in the United States could do in terms of, of spending itself to success. And he insisted that we increase our set-aside for depreciation and put it in the budget. Now, that raised a lot of hackles within the faculty because that meant it was taking away from current teaching and current research money. It would, you had to take it out of the faculty budget and put it into a reserve to repair the roof. Later on, everybody realized that it was a, a, a wise thing. It's just the kind of career that the more you know about it, the more you admire the man, and the more you're, you're thankful that he was here at a very, very pivotal time in Cornell's history. Cornell stumbled with recovery. The recovery was Dale Corson. Their friend, E.B. White, expressed his profound admiration to Dale and Nellie Corson for taking Cornell through its dark days. A whole generation of university presidents was sacrificed on the protest altar. President of Cornell, President of Columbia, President of Duke, President of Stanford, Chancellor at Berkeley, just go around the country. It was the second generation of people, which included me, who had had the experience of living through that first generation, who had gained some idea of what you had to do to cope with the problems. In 1977, Dale Corson retired. Well, not exactly. He assumed one major task after another for Congress, the White House, and the World Bank. Corson was instrumental in improving scientific relations with Japan, modernizing technology in China, and balancing national security with the open exchange of ideas. We saw him in his role on different committees, and we knew we had a winner here in terms of organizing important academy activities, such as the Government University Industry Roundtable. The magic of the roundtable was that it had sitting there the senior scientific person in each one of the agencies in Washington. So we would have the vice president for research of Merck, say, or I know Monsanto was there, and General Electric, and so on. Uh, big companies who knew what the problems were of, of, of staying alive, meeting a payroll, making a product, getting it accepted, dealing with government regulations. Uh, Dale could manage that process extremely well, and he brought it off. And to this day, the round table survives. He helped open up scientific, U.S. scientific relations with China. He has very close relationships with many Japanese scholars. He's a person with wonderful aesthetic sense. His photographs have been shown and exhibited by professional photographers, including Cornell Kappa, who admired Dale's photographs very much. I started working in photography when I was seven years old. Uh, I had an aunt who developed all her uh, own negatives and printed her own pictures in a house that did not have electricity in it. I've always tried to isolate a little part of the world, just, uh, whether it's a bird or a flower or a little piece of the earth, and look at it in t detail and look at it critically with a photograph. Corson and a colleague, Paul Lorraine, found textbooks on electromagnetism lacking, so they decided to write their own. That was a mistake. That was an enormous task. I sure did learn a lot uh, writing it. But for nearly two years, I came to my office every Sunday morning with a paper bag lunch, brown bag lunch, and worked till five in the afternoon. And, uh, sometimes made no progress at all. But we finally got it done. It was published in 1962 and held a major share of the market for a long time. It's, in, it's been through three editions. 
when Dale uh, thinks about something, he immediately starts to learn all he can about it, and he made himself an absolute expert on sundials, uh, including, including the correction for the, uh, uh, the day of the year. Somehow they had the idea that I was the sundial expert on the campus, which I was. When they brought me their designs, uh, I found all kinds of trouble with it, and uh, to the point of dismay on their part, and finally they said, you do it. It works pretty well. It gets a couple of minutes off as part of the year. It won't be better than the clock in McGraw Tower now, because that's a precise clock, but in the clock that's been there until now, it was better than that. Corson has earned some of the nation's highest awards, but one recent honor especially moved him. One of the things that's been so special has been the gift given to Dale and Nellie by his family, which was a new bell for our refurbished chimes. And so as we uh, listen to the chimes now that are 21 bells, uh, one of those new ones is because of a gift uh, to Dale and Nellie. It just seemed like an extraordinary thing to do. And uh, not sure they can afford to do it, but uh, very nice. And but we had the pleasure of going out to the foundry in Ohio to see the bell cast and see it here when it came back. He and Nellie realized that they'd never been up the tower in all the years to see where the chimes were going. So upon their return, uh, we arranged for another visit for them to climb the scaffolding uh, to the top of McGraw Tower. Everdale, he had a camera with him and has recorded one of the most beautiful f photographs we'll ever have of Hope Plaza. In his 80s, Dale Corson remains an innovator. He helped launch the retirement community, Kendall at Ithaca. And as always, there was attention to detail. Well, Dale is a first-rate mixer of concrete to very high standards. When we first visited Kendall, where the Corsons are now, I was walking with Dale down a pedestrian path and pointed down, yeah, 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 I know, it's terrible concrete. That concrete has now been replaced. <laughs> Dale has, has made sure that it's just to be standard. I was able to make uh, moderate contributions and maybe even substantial contributions here and there by going and getting involved in lots of different things. I'm not sure it was wise. And I don't know if I didn't advise any other people to get involved in as many things. Dale is the epitome of the scientist who does his best to bring the force of science to bear on the improvement of people everywhere. We just assumed that probably he would teach school, maybe in a small college in Kansas, and I don't think we thought much farther ahead than that. A large part of my career, everything I've done since, stemmed from my acceptance as a graduate student at Berkeley. And that surely was a toss of a coin. That I got there, and uh, that got me to MIT, and that got me to Washington, and that got me to Los Alamos, and that got me to Cornell. And, uh, one thing follows from another. So uh, I just had extremely good fortune. Uh, here I am.